but Kohunovai is mother to an amazing son who is full of creativity and questions and dancing. And he's over here in the corner. Oh, no, he was here, but he's not here right now. He's running, running. Um, she, as a young adult at UH Manoa, she was encouraged, mentored, and supported by many, including um, Haunani K. Trask, to pursue graduate studies and to apply her work to address community challenges. She was the first person to hire me when I moved back from Seattle. Yay, thank you for that. <laughs> Um, she's also the first and founding director of Native Hawaiian Student Services. Um, so prior to that, if you were Native Hawaiian and went to UH Manoa, it was a good luck. Yes, you can do it. But so Native Hawaiian Student Services um, was part of the work that Kuhunavai began to help systemically support students to graduate from UH Manoa, Native Hawaiian Student Success. Um, and she now works as um, an assistant professor at the UH Manoa College of Education, encouraging and mentoring and supporting others, similar to how others did that for her, um, to apply their work to address community challenges through education. And a lot of her work focuses on indigenous students' success. Um, most recently, there, um, she just published and co-edited two books, um, the first is called A Nation Rising, Hawaiian Movements for Life, Land, and Sovereignty. And the second was Kanaka Oivi Methodology. So without further ado, I'll bring you Kahunawai. <laughs> She's also hilarious. So we're going to have fun. I can use this this now. Yep. Okay. Kahunawai. Yep. Well, mahalo. I actually wish you guys never do so much of a introduction it makes me feel like I have so much pressure now especially because my auntie is here you know what I mean oh my goodness thank you and then this yeah um, so the title of my talk today is re-envisioning Native Hawaiian student success part one so hopefully people will come back for part two um, before I get started I want to kind of do an overview of the the talk and I call it talk story because it seems so weird for me to stand here and be like, I'm the expert, because I'm clearly not the expert. Um, I've done a little bit of work in this area, um, and I've been way interested in the practice part. So um, that's a lot of the work that I did with Native Hawaiian Student Services. So I'm going to get to um, the overview. So aloha, mahalo for having me. Um, so first, again, my name is Erin Kahunavaika Ala Wright. Yes, I'm named for the mountain that is in this area. Um, my grandfather on my mother's side uh, his family is from Waianae as well. Um, my dad was born and raised in Nanakuli, 4th Avenue. Um, my grandparents, David and Lucy Wright, um, had all of their children there, um, including my dad. So I spent many, many summers and many, many weekends here um, traversing this aina with my cousins and um, the rest of my family. So I wanted to mahalo this area for just all of the inspiration to think about these kinds of issues, um, as well as obviously to my ohana. I also wanted to um, have a, send a special thank you to all of my hoapili over here, um, Malia and Andy, Lehua, Kehau, my friend Homai and her family for the beautiful lei, um, and for help with watching my kid because he's kind of crazy and he's like running around. So if he comes up here, he doesn't know boundaries. So he'll just come up and if you don't mind, I might have to talk to him and then send him on his way. Um, <laughs> So I was going to say, ohana ya, so we'll be okay. Um, so mahalo to all of you guys for coming. I know you probably have other things to do tonight than listen to me over here yapping. Um, but I really appreciate you guys coming here. So the overview of the session today um, is, okay, aloha mahalo, we got that out of the way. So the theme that I wanted to have for the session, or actually the two talks that I'm going to do, is um, oke kahua ma mua mahope oke kukulu. So the first part of what we're gonna do today is really establish some of the historical context for um, Native Hawaiian education in Hawaii. I think oftentimes we forget about what happened in the past and how it, it affects our present day um, situation. And so it's very important as a student of Honani K. Tras to really historicize and problematize in the fancy language or in other words, learn about our history and where we come from. Um, to really have a better understanding of where we are today. 
The Mahope Kekukulu is sort of in brackets because that's sort of where we're going to be moving to in the next part of it. So right now, um, I know Lorianne gave an awesome presentation about a lot of the needs that this side of the island has in terms of um, teacher parity and cultural, I, for lack of a better word, competency for the teachers on this coast to understand the community and our kids. Um, but we're not going to get to the action part quite yet. We're going to just do some of the con contextual understanding. Um, the next part I'm going to go to is Kukalao Lama. It's really, I like to think of as sort of guideposts to think about, or not guideposts, more like um, just thoughts to have as we go through this presentation. And then always in the back of our minds, this question is, should be there, right? How have we come to think about Native Hawaiians, education, and student success? OK. So um, before, again, some more contextualizing. The way I wanted to start this off was with a quote from Manu Meyer. So she says, the origin of thought, even before sound begins to shape language, is found in intention. Intention is the portal to right action. It inspires motivation, movement, and why we understand anything. We must first watch our intention, then prepare, then set out into excellence. With that said, again, my intention in facilitating this discussion is not to stand here again as the expert, but really to start a conversation and to get us thinking about how do we think about student success? What, it, what are the measures of student success? How do we know we're successful? Is it that our kids get good jobs? Is it that um, we have bigger houses, we have fancy cars? How do we figure out how we're successful? And what is the role of education in understanding um, that success? So really, this talk is to get you thinking about how do I think about success? And then hopefully, as we move through this presentation, you'll start to think a little bit differently about success. So again, the theme of tonight is really to figure out where to build. So not even talking about the building yet. Where are we going to build? What does the terrain look like? So that's, to me, what history stands for. Um, and really, if you thought this, <laughs> my presentation was going to be about all the deficit models we have out there about our kids and about our people, it's, you're totally wrong. Not going to talk about low test scores, not going to talk about how our kids um, get more behavioral um, suspensions than anybody else. I'm not going to talk about any of those deficits. What we're going to do is start off with how public education was um, built in the kingdom. Think about these questions as we move along. <clears throat> How does our past connect us to our present and our future? And also remember what is, what is, is not what has to be. So that's something I always tell my students in class because everybody sort of seems resigned to that. This is just the way it is, right? Test scores are gonna be used to measure our aptitude to go to college. Test scores are the thing that's gonna make us be successful. And what I'm saying is it doesn't have to be, right? There's other ways that we can think about it. So just keep your mind a little bit open, or a lot open, not just a little bit, a lot. Um, what do we think constitutes success for our Native Hawaiian people? Again, going back to how do we think we're successful? What does it mean for our students to experience success, and how do we know it, and how do we measure it, for lack of a better term? Also, I'm going to ask you to examine why do you think, that, why do you think um, about success in this particular way? Is it something that is just a normal thing? Or is it something that has been sort of fed to us over the course of our history? And finally, I want to keep this idea of Hawaiian survivance, <clears throat> which is an idea that has been forwarded by uh, Noilani Gujir Ka'opua, which is um, one of the pieces, seminal pieces of work for my presentation. Um, and Hawaiian survivance is really this idea of Hawaiian people are not just surviving. We're thriving, and we're going to build um, we're going to continue on um, in this way. So it's not just resisting, it's not just surviving, but it's renewal and it's continuity into the future. Um, and survivance entails, she says, it's survivance entails the continuation of language, history, and knowledge of an indigenous people and focuses on hopeful, a hopeful resurrection of culture as opposed to a focus on loss and tragedy. So we're not going to talk about the ways in which pe people have talked about our people as being deficits, right? About all the ways that we're not achieving. 
Um, we're gonna, I'm gonna, I hope to show you the rich history that our people have had in being active agents in their own education. And hopefully this can help us change the ways we think about what success means for our people. So John Osorio says, in 1893, our people also understood themselves to be Hawaiian, not American. I want us to consider the very interesting notion that we Hawaiians are better off in 1893 than 1993. So I use this quote from Dr. Osorio as a way to get us thinking about what it means, what, what does it mean that we were better off in 1893 than we are nowadays? What we can see is back, in the, back when the kingdom um, was still intact, well, some people say that the kingdom still is intact. So for those of you who are about, the, about occupation, um, my discourse is gonna be a little bit different. So, cause there's, I know there's people who believe in, you know, Hawaiian independence and our kingdom was never given away or taken away. Um, but what I, wanna, what I wanted to do with this particular quote was to help us think about what our kupuna were like in 1893 and what happened to us as of night, today. What are all of the socio-political, socio-historical things that happened to our people over the course of that 100 years to change dramatically the health and the well-being of our people. So, when we, um, so we're going to take a leap forward um, to talk about public education in Hawaii. So I think most people think, right, most of us grew up thinking that um, public education or formal education started when the missionaries came, right, in 1820. How many of you knew that there were four Hawaiians who were on the boat with the missionaries at the time? Okay, a couple people did. So there were four Hawaiians, right, who were also on the boat um, with the missionaries who had also been training the missionaries in our language and in um, helping them to develop um, uh, how to teach and sort of the strategies on how to promote literacy in the Hawaiian community. Um, <clears throat> and so when we think about how public education started, we, again, it's not independent of Hawaiian agency. Hawaiians were very, um, were, were active participants. So this is the quote I wanted you to um, reflect on too. So again, we get fed that literacy didn't happen until you know, the missionaries were here. And Kanaka never had a significant role in promoting literacy among our people, which is not true. So the way that Ka'opua, Goodyear Ka'opua thinks about it is that there was um, a companionship between Kanaka Maoli and Haole um, to develop these systems of education. So Hawaiians played a very significant role in creating the public education system during the kingdom time. So missionaries, again, are largely credited with establishing the written form and then teaching Hawaiians to read. But it's important to note, again, that there are Hawaiians there who arrived in 1820, Gujar Kaupua um, names Thomas Hopu as one of the Kanaka who were on board, who actually was already developing his own um, writing system using Hawaiian because he was writing letters. And so when you see the letters and you see the alphabet that the missionaries um, came up with at Lahaina Luna, you'll see that they're actually mirror of e they're mirror of each other, yet Hopu never gets any kind of credit right, for helping to establish that kind of um, the written word. <clears throat> and so when the missionaries first came, and with the help of Hawaiians, they started to set up these mission station schools, right? Because like in other indigenous communities, religion was very closely aligned to education. Um, and so they became points of access for Hawaiians to learn how to read and to learn how to write. So why was religion, or why, was, why were churches the first places that the Hawaiians were led to, to learn how to do this. What, 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 what? So why did they want to teach Hawaiians how to write? Because they wanted us to learn how to read? Because they wanted us to, mahalo. Why did they want us to, why did they want to bring literacy to the, to the heathens? Yes, they wanted us to be. So that's Lahaina, um, a view from Lahaina Luna. They wanted, to, they wanted us to be Christians. Um, I also bought my, so one of the awesomest, best gifts my mom ever gave me was, so the, my, my, the Bible um, that would belong to my great grandmother. 
and then also um, my great great grandmother's um, her her songbook from Sunday school, and she has like writing in here, and it's really cool. It's all eaten up, um, but it's really it's really a treasure to me. And I think about at that time there was almost no illiteracy among our people, right? So people like my grandparents who never, or my great grandparents and their parents who never really went to formal school. They knew how to read, they knew how to write, they knew how to um, go to business offices. And my grandmother, my great grandmother, or my great great grandmother actually was a, was a purveyor of land. So she loved to buy land. So when you go to the Bureau of Conveyances, she looks like she's bought all kinds of land. And I kept thinking, wow, this is a woman who maybe went to elementary school but yet she's able to do all of these things. So there's so much richness, right, in our community. And I'm sure all of us have those kinds of um, stories within our own families. Right, okay, so the Bible was the first publication, um, formal publication, um, that was done in Hawaiian at Lahaina Luna. So what did public schools look like during the first part of the kingdom? Um, because I am blind, I cannot see my, okay. <laughs> so the first missionary troop came in 1820, or the Calvinist missionaries, I should say, came in 1820. So by 1832, they set up um, station, mission stations all over the islands. They had 53,000 pupils in 900 schools. The vast majority of the Kumu were Hawaiian. There was only a very small portion of missionaries who were able to manage the schools at that time. Um, in Goodyear Ka'opua's book, um, she says that if the missionaries were in charge of um, the primary teaching of literacy, it would have been one missionary for every, I think she has 1,000 students. So you can see that they did a good, teacher education was um, going on in the early 19th century for Hawaiian people. By the next year, um, the first, the first Hawaiian language newspaper was published. We see the dramatic decrease in pupils, in people, pupils in schools. It seemed that Hawaiians learned what they wanted to, they wanted to learn, and they left. And we often see this actually in higher education. Um, Hawaiians, in their idea of success, at least in my experience, I've, and so again to be clear, my expertise is, or my, my expertise in quotes, um, is not in his, the history of education. It's not in K-12. It's actually in higher ed. So I'm, I'm having to learn all this stuff sort of backwards. Um, so what, we, what I learned from my experience in working in higher education is that Hawaiians don't look, oftentimes don't look at degrees as a measure, measure of success. A lot of the times it's just practical. I like go to school because I like learn these three things and then I'm going to bounce. But when you're in the university, all you see is people are dropping out. Not to say that there isn't issues with retaining Hawaiian students in higher education, but what I'm saying is our views of success, right, are very different, or our views of what is necessary is, is very different. Um, in 1840, the first constitution of Hawaii was promulgated by Kaui Keauli, or Kamehameha III, and included in his constitution was the codification and institutionalization of public schooling. So the government, even at that time in Hawaii, decided that this is something that they want to invest in. Um, so we see that happening. Um, the same year, we see the, uh, the founding of the Chief Children's School, which is now Royal School um, in downtown Honolulu. In 1841, we see that David Malo is appointed as the first head of public, um, I think it's like public instruction. And he appoints Kanaka as superintendents to each of the districts um, to supervise all of those government schools in those areas. So again, when we think about Hawaiians in education and sort of how we have no connection to it or we're so disenfranchised from education, we see it in our history just in this little part that Hawaiians had a very critical role in establishing um, or participating in education as well as building systems of education. Um, and then by 1842, we see that education becomes mandatory um, for the kingdom. So in order, so the Kaui Keoli saw education, right, as being something that a Hawaiian citizen, to be a good Hawaiian citizen, you needed to participate in. Um, in fact, he decreed he aupuni palapalako'u, he kanakapono, 
Oyoko Kanaka, so mine is the kingdom of education or of documents, that's the other um, kauna of it. The righteous man is my man. Very gendered too. Um, so literacy became fully integrated into society. Um, Gujar Kaupua calls this Kanaka's move toward um, institutionalizing education as a self-modernizing project. So Hawaiians saw on the horizon what was coming. This was one of the ways that they decided to engage in sort of this global political um, arena. So Hawaiians didn't want to be left behind because they knew in order to be, to maintain the sovereignty and the health and the wellness of their kingdom, they needed to sort of get into the game of the, the rest of the world. So the majority of schools at this time were Hawaiian language medium institutions. So we see this as the predominant um, language of instruction up until um, almost the late 19th century. So we can think about when Hawaiians are taught in their own language, what are the things they get to learn? And they're being taught by Hawaiian people. They're being taught what? I like you guys talk because I gotta take a break. So, what are, so if we're having Hawaiian people teaching Hawaiian people in their own language, what do we see? Why is this a good thing? Sorry, what? Okay, okay, higher academic rates. What are the, can we think of some of the cultural things that are being transmitted? So, right, so all of, and from a Hawaiian perspective, right, if we're using our language, we're using our worldview in order to teach these different concepts. School was, right, right. So Osorio also says something about that, where he says, you know, in this time, Hawaiians knew they were Hawaiians, right? They knew that they weren't Americans. And so that does something to our self-concept in a way that we um, engage with the material, but also giving us a sense of grounding, like this is our aina, this is the way that our kupuna have always sort of navigated this place, so we belong somewhere. Um, so by, wait, let me get to that later. I'm gonna get on my soapbox a little bit. Um, <laughs> so at the time, at this, part of, at this part of the history of our kingdom, we see that Hawaiians are predominantly the kumu, they're being taught in Hawaiian. Um, and this, there was a big, there was tension that was growing at this time too between the Haole missionaries and Hawaiian statesmen. So the Hawaiian, the folks in the Hawaiian legislature and the folks of the Hawaiians that were, um, what is the English word? The, the advisees of the king um, supported these kinds of movements because they knew that there was an important, the, the import they knew the importance of maintaining sort of that cultural identity um, and that's connected to the national identity. So we don't see funding to English medium schools um, until the 1850s. So now we have you know, stuff like this where, hey, Ilio. So this is what a lot of our, um, the early um, pedagogical materials or the school, the school curriculum sort of look like or the materials for school. So between 1834 and 1948, there are over 100, language, 100 Hawaiian language newspapers. So the first Hawaiian-owned, Hawaiian-edited appeared in 1861. Um, oh, jeez. And it was Kahoku Kapaki Pika. Um, so to show, I mean, the, the reason why I like to bring up also Hawaiian language newspapers, it really just showed sort of the robustness and the dynamism that Hawaiians had at the time, right? They learn how to read, they learn how to write, what do they do? They create these awesome mele, they start recording everything and anything, they start publishing these newspapers, they start, and in the newspapers, if any of you have gotten to see them, right, they have everything in there, right? I'm a lawyer, hire me. This is the story of Cavello. This is what my grandma told me about whatever. I found my um, kupuna's names in the delinquent taxes. <laughs> So you can find anything in those papers. <laughs> of course, I was like looking them up and I'm like, oh, of course my family would be late in the taxes and had like my great great grandmother, her sister, and then her brother. So the whole Ohana was in there. And that is on my mother's side, so not my paternal side, <laughs> just to be clear. But just to show you really the, I mean, the fact that Hawaiians produced over 100,000 pages of 
new PEPA, which you can still actually go help in Kiko Kiko and translate, um, is unbelievable, unbelievable to me. And to think of where Hawaiians were at in terms of literacy and generating knowledge and um, produce, producing knowledge and disseminating knowledge and to think of how we think about Hawaiian success now is like a 180, right? When we think of Hawaiian students, what do we always hear? Underachieving, they don't behave, they cannot you know, listen, their parents don't value education. Um, and so to think that this is the kind of history we come from and where we are now is, and is completely at odds. So what did public schools look like during the second half of the century, the 19th century? So what we see um, in public schools is a movement towards English medium education. And the primary motivation for moving towards um, English medium education and also defunding um, Hawaiian, or what they call common schools back then. So common schools were the schools that Hawaiians and Asian, the Asian population, so the folks that were brought here to work on the plantations were being um, underfunded. So does that remind you of anything that we're going through right now? Yeah. Right. <laughs> so when we think about systems, which I thought was really awesome of Lori to talk about, this is where we see the system start coalescing to what we see now, right? So we see schools become part of this contested terrain between non-native businessmen and native leadership. So non-native businessmen who are often the offspring of missionaries, we're now moving into the business arena, right? They're getting into sugar. They're getting into, um, sugar was probably the biggest thing at that time. But there's all kinds of other businesses that, that the sons of the missionaries were getting into. And in order to fulfill that sort of piece of their lives, they also had to use schooling. So schooling became a way of sorting and segregating groups for plantation society, at least for the common schools, right? So at the time, we also see the founding of what schools? We see Punahou. We see um, Kamehameha toward the ending of the century. But when you look at the curriculum between the two schools, we see that a school like Punahou, um, and that's a bang on Punahou. Punahou is a wonderful school, and they're doing a lot for Hawaiians now. It's really awesome. Um, but we see that in those early years, the Punahou kids would be the ones who have like a liberal arts education, right? We, they'd have education of the mind. They'd be exposed to geography. They'd be exposed to um, art and these higher, I guess people call them higher order thinking, which I, I think is really not a good way to think about it, but they had access to these kinds of um, knowledges that they didn't give to Hawaiians, right? So Hawaiians were said, you know, because we can only work, that's the only thing we're gonna be taught to do. Um, so we weren't exposed to sort of the breadth and the depth of knowledge that is out there. Um, with the exception, I, I would say, of the Ali'i. The Ali'i had a little bit of a different um, um, education and schooling than the, than the Hawaiians who went to the common schools. We also see a change in the leadership of public schools. So instead of people like David Malo, we see Charles Reed Bishop. Y'all know who Bishop is, right? Right. So he serves for a decade almost as the president of the Board of Education. And so what does he do? So this is what Charles Reed Bishop thinks of us. Take a drink of water. <clears throat> so he says, the rising generation of Hawaiians are not as industrious as their ancestors were. That they, and especially those educated in the high schools and the English, in English language, have wrong ideas about labor. In short, they are lazy and idle and have much more of pride and conceit than is good for them. So these are some of the ideas about Hawaiians, right, that start getting embedded, that are embedded in our education system. So when we think about what the narrative is about Hawaiians in school today, we can see these kinds of ideas, right? Hawaiians are lazy, Hawaiians are this, Hawaiians are that. Um, and when we're looking at the leadership of the public education system saying that, you can see how those kinds of ideas become institutionalized in our system, yeah? So it's not someone's opinion, 
it's not what some, just what somebody thinks. When you have somebody who thinks like that, who, is in, who has power, they're gonna deploy that power in order to actualize their thinking. Um, maybe a little bit too conspiracy theory for you, but all I gotta say is think about how they talk about our kids now, right? Um, so when you know, we talk about systems and educate, public education as a system, and we talk about um, structural oppression and how our people have been systematically um, barred from exercising their full sort of um, lives into education, we can see that these are some of the seeds that, have, that were planted, which is a bad thing, because that's the name of Noilani Gujar Kaupo's book. <laughs> but this is the bad seeds that were planted um, in our public educational system. And then we see that a lot of what Charles Reed Bishop was doing in terms of um, structuring the educational system, the public educational system as unequal by underfunding Hawaiian and Asian common schools and providing good funding for the English medium schools, that he's already created right a sort of disenfranchisement of Hawaiians. When you look at the curriculum again, a, a deep separation between what, it, what would be like a good education and what would be sort of a not good education. And all of this is motivated, I shouldn't say all of it, but from what I can see in terms of the evidence, it just points to because he wanted to control the ways in which people had access to power. He wanted to, he had large investments. So when he was making all these decisions, we gotta remember he had large investments in sugar. Yeah, so when you think about how do, I, how do I provide my sugar plantation with sort of cheap labor, what am I gonna do? I can control this education system and sort the kids out and say, well, these kids are gonna be um, the workers and then these kids are gonna be the leaders of our nation. And then we have someone like Matayo Kekuanoa. So Kekuanoa advocated for equitable funding of the common schools. So there wasn't, it wasn't that Hawaiians weren't fighting for um, equitable funding or to have our kids or the kids at that time um, not have a good school, not have good schooling. Um, but he was also working against um, larger sort of social political forces. So when we look at the mid to the late 19th century, we can see that there's all these other forces that are happening, right? The businessmen are getting together. They're plotting to overthrow the, the kingdom. Um, they've already set sort of the tone with um, the bayonet constitution, which Kalako was forced to, to sign. Um, we already have the Treaty of Reciprocity, which um, gave America, um, which gave America tariff-free sugar. Um, and Pearl Harbor. Um, so we can see that this sort of larger stage was being set for um, our schools to change. Sorry, I'm like getting distracted <laughs> on a kiki. Um, okay, so Kekuanoa again. So he was really the one to start fighting to get, because he could see this happening. Kekuanoa was one of the, I think he, like he was one of the heroes to me in this sort of era, because he really fought hard um, for churches to get out of public schooling. He also fought again to support the equitable pay and the equitable funding of Hawaiian schools and Hawaiian teachers. Um, and he said, it is necessary to provide as far as possible for all the people the advantage of a common school education. The common school should come to be regarded as strictly neutral ground in religious matters. He also fought again to keep Hawaiian language medium education alive. Because at that time, there was an English medium, um, English medium movement. So he, was saying, he said, the theory of substituting the English language for the Hawaiian in order to educate our people is as dangerous to Hawaiian nationality as it is useless in promoting the general education of the people. If we wish to preserve the, king, the kingdom of Hawaii for Hawaiians and to educate our people, we must insist that Hawaiian language shall be the language of all national schools and that English should be taught, shall be taught whenever practicable 
but only as an important branch of Hawaiian education. So you can see his orientation was very much on maintaining the sovereignty of the Hawaiian kingdom and using education as a way to maintain cultural identity, to, to um, maintain national identity as um, Hawaiian nationals, as citizens of the Hawaiian kingdom. And this wasn't just, and then also it's important to note, this wasn't just for Hawaiians, right? It was also for non-Hawaiians, because we had non-Hawaiian um, citizens as well. And so to engender that kind of identity um, among the citizens of Hawaii, it was very important to Kekuana Oa, especially for Hawaiians, because he was one of the most staunch supporters of um, Hawaiians continuing to be leadership in the kingdom. So what do we see at the turn of the century? And so this is sort of like the fast forward, right, for 100 years. We see the formal ban of Hawaiian language um, medium education, which was not reversed, right, until the 1980s. Looking at Kehau Pu'u, because she's the work immersion. The 1980s, right, 1980 something, 86. So it's almost a hundred, pretty much almost 100 years of Hawaiian language medium education being banned from the classroom. So remember when we think about the role of Hawaiian language um, among, in our classrooms and for our, especially Hawaiian kids, we can see that by banning it, what does it do? It takes away all of that cultural identity, takes away um, that link for our kids to the past, it really takes away a lot of that sort of foundational knowledge um, that really inform our kids' sense of self. And then also to, also their positioning in the world. Like when Osorio says, we knew we were Hawaiians and not Americans. So we're repositioning ourselves, right? So instead of being Hawaiians and Hawaiian um, citizens, by banning the language, we start removing ourselves from that essential identity. Then we also have, again, I have asterisks by the illegal overthrow of the Hawaiian Kingdom and the illegal annexation, again, because for the occupation people. Um, so I guess for me, um, I say the illegal overthrow of the Hawaiian Kingdom and illegal annexation um, of the Hawaiian Kingdom to the United States, because sort of that's, to me, that's the reality of what we're living in, right? The crazy part of living under US uh, colonization is that so now we have this foreign system that is in place that has created, I feel, um, a huge disconnect for our people um, from themselves and from our lands. And um, that sense of kuleana or kuleana lahui, like that sense of um, responsibility to our nation is also sort of um, fractured and not as strong as um, it once was. Um, okay, that was a downer. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to like, what is the light in here? <laughs> I thought I was going to be positive today. Um, but I think if we look at this history and we see the ways that it informs how, where we are today, it really is instructional, instructive. Um, when we think about the class, when the classes I teach, oftentimes we start off with thinking about what is the purpose and the what is the purpose of education. That's usually the number one thing I ask. And so when you think about education, just in a broad sense, I get you get 20 different answers, right? It's like what we talked about: higher pay. It provides you with um, social mobility. Provides you with a uh, potential to build capital. Um, it makes you a good citizen. But when you're Hawaiian and you're thinking about your positionality in Hawaii as a sort of, you've been disconnected, not, sounds deficit, but the educational system that we've been sort of functioning under separates you from that sort of essential identity. What does the purpose become? Are we seeing ourselves as Hawaiians? Are we seeing ourselves as American? So if we're in an, if we're in an educational system that is created by American people, they're gonna, you know, we're gonna, they want us to be American. That's, education is one of the best tools of colonization. They make us, they try to, they try to make us forget who we are so that we can assimilate into that society. But as we've seen over the last hundred years since this has happened, or over hundred years, it hasn't been working, right? We're still here. We've created our own schools under much duress. Our language is thriving, once again. 
Um, so there, that's the happy part of it. <laughs> During the, so during the kingdom period, so during the, during the 19th century. Well, when we think about Hawaii, Hawaii as the kingdom of Hawaii, as our own sovereign country, um, anybody, it's like America, right? Anybody comes into this kingdom, they're going to go to, the government gets to set the rules about who gets to go where. So there's instances, um, if you look in Eileen Tamura's work, she talks a little bit about um, Japanese trying to establish Japanese language schools and Japanese culture schools, which actually was also frowned upon in the kingdom. Um, because I think uh, the Hawaiian kingdom was looking at making Hawaiian kingdom subjects. They wanted people who are going to be loyal to the kingdom. They wanted people to go to their government schools and become acclimated to um, that sort of way of being. Um, yeah, that's my short answer. And honestly, because I'm not, a, I'm not an education historian, I don't know exactly um, why, but I know that there, there were instances of, of that. And also, too, I don't want people to get the sense of, like, I'm blaming our kupuna for anything. People, yeah, people are going to do, people got to do what they got to do. I always mahalo my kupuna. That, we wouldn't be here otherwise, right? Um, so you're going to navigate it in the way that you feel that you got to navigate it. Um, but I think for me, too, I, I think about, why did, you know, why, did, why, are we, why are we here? Our kupuna worked really hard, right, to get here. They survived. If we think about it, I always think about this, and it makes me a little emotional, but when you think about all the diseases, you think about that, and the fact that we're still standing here is amazing. So I know for me, um, this work tries to honor our kupuna and all of the stuff that they've gone through, yeah. Um, and I know that, um, in the work that I do, I feel like uh, rebuilding that sense of who we are as a people and then connecting that to education and having education be a vehicle, um, a positive vehicle for our people um, and not this sort of negative view um, or a negative experience. I guess that's the thing I think about, the experience that our people have had in these American educational systems. Um, we need to not have that anymore because it's, it's incredibly damaging. And so part of the so what I always go back to is, again, the central question of how do we think about Native Hawaiian success? Again, how do we think about what does success mean to us? Um, and what do we do to engender that success in our people? Um, and if it's in a system that is oppressive, um, and I think the history shows that it wasn't an accident, right, that all of this happened. And it wasn't an accident that our people are in the situation they are now. And by no means are we the only ones, right? If you, so um, if we were to do a parallel of what was happening to American Indians on the continent, you'll see a very similar history, right? Language is taken away, culture is taken away, they're sent away, not even sent away, they're kidnapped to go to boarding schools, their hair is cut, and they have a policy that says, kill the Indian, save the man. And so that, for me, is really emblematic of what was happening also in Hawaii. And, the people in Hawaii who were doing these things were not looking at Hawaii in isolation. They were looking at how do we look around the world and see how other people are colonizing people and, and how are other people um, forcibly assimilating native populations, right? So they looked to the American South for segregation and slavery. They were looking to how American Indian boarding schools were um, being created. Actually, American Indian boarding schools were looking at Hawaii also as a way to figure out how can we civilize the, native, civilize the savages. So there were larger forces going on, I think, in the world that also um, contributed to um, our situation here. OK, I'm going to start stop talking pretty, pretty soon. So when we think about what everybody says about us, I always like to go back to John. Um, John Dominus Holt's quote where he says, they tell us all kinds of things, but what do we think about ourselves? Because really that's what we need to focus on. 
Yeah. What do we think about ourselves in a really very gen gen uh, authentic and genuine way? What do we think about ourselves? For me, I look at this history and I think, wow, they, they navigated so much crazy stuff and still managed to survive. And we're all here as living proof, right? Um, so I feel like if they can do that, we can do our kuleana to sort of move that along. So we have a really rich history of, again, creating educational systems and being advocates for ourselves and thinking about, again, what does it mean to be successful? And what does it mean to be a Hawaiian and be successful in education? Um, and just the last slide again, going back to my original question. So how have we come to think about Native Hawaiians' education and student success? Um, and if there's anything, I think that's what I want folks to think about after this presentation is really how did we get, how did we get here? We look at this history, we look at all of the things that our kupuna did, um, and we look at our current situation now. So how do we get here? And the next step would be how do we, what Meyer says, right, move to excellence. Now that we've thought about this, how do we move to excellence? And I think for a lot of us, that's really overwhelming. Like, oh my God, I gotta solve this whole big problem in like, you know, a year. But when we think about the process that we've gone through and the length of time that it's taken, for us to get to this place. It's gonna take that long at least to get out of it, right? Um, okay, so that's the end. But then I also wanted to, before um, I close out, I wanted to um, mahalo the folks whose work I've really um, lent, leaned upon uh, for this, which is uh, Noilani Gujar Ka'opua, uh, Julie Ka'omea, Gary Okahiro, um, and Eileen Samora. So those are four really wonderful scholars, critical scholars, um, who've written a lot about Hawaiian, um, the history of education in Hawaii. Um, yeah, because like I said, I don't do this kind of work, but I love that their work is there for us to uh, take advantage of. Okay, so um, mahalo.